Hey everybody, how are you? Thanks for joining us again today. How you doing, Jay? I'm doing fantastic. How you doing, Louis? Uh, I'm I'm on the mend. I've been sick for five days. Uh, it sucks, but uh, I'm super pumped up. And uh, it was a game day decision, but here I am, suit and all, uh, to chat with a brilliant mind, uh, fairly new mind within the last couple of years, really emerged on the scene. But uh, we've had some viewer questions, um, some pretty aggressively worded about, you know, how uh, how much are we going to hold Ross Coldheart's feet over the fire? Right. And uh, we're going to ask him some stuff. And uh, basically, even down to the point of we know he's in touch with these congressional people, people that are going to be testifying. And, uh, you know, is the sort of infighting and a lot of the snowball throwing that's going on, is that actually preventing us from moving forward? I mean, I think that we run the risk maybe now of, you know, looking like a taboo subject that it doesn't get the light that it's deserved. And we're so close. So uh, right. I want to ask him a couple of things. I know you've got some things in your mind that uh, we want to ask. And uh, we want to get to know Mr. Ross Coulter on episode 101 here of UAP Studies Podcast. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to another episode of UAP Studies Podcast. I am Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my good friend and illustrious co-host, Jason Gilmet. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm good. I'm five days into this COVID nonsense. Uh, so if I can make it through the show without throwing up or passing out, it's going to be a good one. Well, it but, just shows that you're a trooper, that uh, you, you still do the, the podcast yeah. even when you're not feeling well, so that's good. It was a game day decision. Let's just leave it at that. But uh, I didn't want to miss today's show. We do have a phenomenal mind on the topic, um, you know, an investigative journalist, an author of many books. Uh, I'll name just a few here, Dead Man Running, The Lost Diggers, Charles Bean, and recently uh, In Plain Sight, um, and also the co-host of a new show called Need to Know, which is co-hosted with uh, Bryce Zabel. Uh, we are very excited to welcome to the show today, Mr. Ross Coulter. Good morning or good evening, gentlemen. How are you both? Fantastic. Doing well. Well, yeah. could be better, but good enough. I'm excited. Uh, any day, it's a good day. We can chat about this stuff. And I think I'm running off adrenaline fumes alone. So... Uh, we'll so get got, into you. Got uh, co- have you got COVID at the moment, Louie? My family did. Yeah, last week. We have an 18-year-old baby. In the middle of the night, she just started throwing up. And uh, my wife and uh, daughter took a test, and they were positive. I was negative for the whole week. I sequestered and kept going to work, tested every morning. And then uh, I believe it was uh, Thursday. It was, yeah, Thursday, I started to feel a little tickle in my throat, and I didn't want to test just yet. I thought, let it develop and then see. And uh, I took a test later that evening. And instead of the, the test being that pink ribbon, mine was almost black. So, um, wow. yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, I've had a, an appetite throughout. It's not like a typical flu. The flu, it seems like your symptoms are day by day. You know, you start to feel down and then you can tell when the fever's broken. And this kind of feels like the reaction from the vaccine. You know, you get this burst of cold chills and then you're fine. And then your body hurts, and then you're fine. You have a, a post nasal drip, but no congestion. Very odd. Not and not like anything I've ever had before. So sure. Yeah. Not a joke for sure. But uh, no. let's get into yourself, uh, who you are and what you've done. Your career mm. obviously is a, an amazing one. And then recently what led you into that sort of shift into the UAP world and uh, and what you're working on currently. So you want me to give you a bit of background about myself? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. I, I, I'm an Australian based investigative journalist and author. Uh, I've lived in Australia for 37 years. I uh, was born in the UK, moved to New Zealand as a young boy because my father was convinced there was going to be a nuclear war, kind of ironic in light of the current international climate. And um, I graduated as a lawyer from a university in New Zealand, practiced briefly as a lawyer and uh, decided that I was far too nosy and became a journalist instead and focused very much on long form investigative journalism. I've worked for the New Zealand Herald newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, the um, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC. Um, uh, I've been on all of the premier public affairs programs in the country. I've, I've most recently been a a uh, reporter for a program called 60 Minutes, which is the sister program of the CBS 60 Minutes program in America. 
Um, and I'm currently uh, an investigative journalist reporter with the Spotlight program on the Channel 7 network in Australia, which is Australia's number one commercial TV network. And um, I do contribute contributory um, investigative journalism pieces, uh, mainly true crime. I'm investigating a murder at the moment. I, I do the, the UAP stuff in between my day job. Um, I've done two major documentaries on UAPs since I published my book In Plain Sight about a year ago. Uh, in Plain Sight should be available in North America, but my uh, publisher is pretty bloody hopeless about getting it on the shelves. But uh, if you go on Amazon, you'll find it. It's uh, In Plain Sight, an investigation into UFOs and impossible science. And as a result of that book, I, um, I was encouraged by my TV network to go to the States last year, and I interviewed a large number of people for a, a film that we ended up calling The UFO Phenomenon. And... Uh, that's viewable on the Spotlight Channel 7 Australia channel on YouTube. And I think at last guess in the current iteration, it's it's had close to 15 to 20 million views. It's um it's taken me back actually as a as a journalist. I've been quite surprised at the uh the fact that I just treated this like any other story, to be perfectly honest. I I'm a journalist, I jump from story to story. Uh, uh, I'm very used to coming in and becoming, if you like, an instant expert on something and then moving on. And um, when I wrote my book, I was really struck by the fact that this is a taboo area for mainstream media, that that one of the things you learn in uh, journalism as a cub cadet reporter is that it's kind of part of the culture of media organisations that UFO stories are to be treated with ridicule and contempt and derision. And if you do mention them, they're only ever meant to be done with a tongue in your cheek. And it's not like there's men in black sitting in the back of the editorial conferences. It's literally that there is a culture, an attitude inside the mainstream media, which basically treats this subject with derision. And I have to admit that when I wrote my book, when I was researching it for about three years, I, I came into it with very much that perspective. And fortuitously, serendipitously, at the time that I was researching, I was also working for Australia's 60 Minutes. And so I was regularly in and out of America and particularly in and out of uh, Washington. And I, because of my job, I've done national security, terrorism, defense stories quite a lot. And I have sources in the intelligence and defense community around the world. And I started asking, just dropping it into conversations over a beer, you know, what, what about this UFO stuff? You know, what do you, what do you think about that? And I was quite struck at the uh, cognitive dissonance, if you like, between the public narrative, which is one of ridicule and stigma, and the private narrative, which I was getting from many of the people that I talked to, who are members of the Yakuza, the, the um, UK, USA, Canada, New Zealand, Australia alliance of um, the five eyes. I was quite struck about the behind the scenes narrative that privately they were admitting that they were seeing take, intelligence take on the phenomenon in the Five Eyes intelligence databases, that it was being freely and openly discussed, that there is a, a phenomenon which is basically breaching airspace, particularly national security airspace. And it struck me that there was a story here, and I still think there's a story there, that, that essentially the media is largely ignoring. We are essentially being, I think, hoodwinked into ignoring a subject which I think is one of the most profound issues of the moment. And Absolutely. that's me. Yeah. And have you noticed a shift at all in the last two years, like from what you started off as to what like, was a ridicule from the start for you? Like, did you have any buddy say, don't cover this subject? Or was it sort of something that you introduced to new reporters and that maybe they're taking more seriously now? I don't see a dramatic shift. I mean, I, I certainly for myself um, at the very beginning of my research, when I was telling friends who are mainstream media journalists, uh, I, I'm a fairly senior investigative journalist in this country and internationally, and I've collaborated on investigations with the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Toronto Star, and, you know, a lot of the major newspapers around the world. So, you know, I'm, I'm a member of a, a group called ICIJ, which is the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists based in Washington, D.C. 
And a lot of my friends and colleagues in, in different media organizations were basically saying to me, gee, you're, you're taking a risk. You know, what a, what a crazy, foolish thing to, to go and do a book about UFOs. You know, you're pissing your reputation up against the wall. And I, I don't see it like that. I didn't see it like that at the time. I, I think that in the media, we have a responsibility to look at stories objectively and not be worried about the stigma that gets attached to an issue. We we should look at the evidence and then confine ourselves to an analysis based on evidence. And on the evidence, when I started looking both at the history and the current evidence for the phenomenon, I thought that the evidence of its existence and its reality was overwhelming. Moreover, one of the things you're taught in, in investigative journalism in particular is to never, ever believe in a cover-up. More often than not, cover-ups are a screw-up. More often than not, it's incompetence that something's being hidden by a bureaucrat. It's not a deliberate policy. But in this case, I've, I've very much come to the view that there is an unwillingness by multiple governments around the world, notably the British, Canadian, Australian, French and uh, American governments, to discuss the reality of the phenomenon. And uh, I think the American government's come part of the way in the last few years with its very, very slow, turtle-like revealing of the fact that it sees the phenomenon as a reality. But to come back to the, the central thrust of your question, do I think that there's been a change? No, I don't. I, I, in fact, I think, if anything, it's being walked back at the moment. I think we're in a, a very dangerous period at the moment for the possibility of any kind of admissions being made by the Pentagon or indeed by the American um, intelligence community or defense community. I, I think that if American mainstream media don't start embracing the subject matter and taking it up and running with it and making it a forefront issue in the national bulletins, then frankly, it's just going to die on the vine. Uh, and I think it will probably be another 70 years before we find out what's really going on even though I'm absolutely convinced that there is a reality there behind the scenes and that we are being lied to. The um, the government, particularly the American government, knows a lot more than it's letting on. Yeah. Lied yeah, to we, and omissions, right? Yeah. We chat with a guy like George Knapp, who's very similar to yourself. He's a CBS reporter in uh, Nevada. He broke the story of Bob Lazar and everything else, and he's been doing this for 30-some years. And for him, when we chatted with him, he said, you know, this is – almost like vindication, you know, like he was warned of the same that you don't want to talk about this stuff. Your career would go way higher if you just stay away from the alien phenomenon. And he believed enough in it that he kept on going. And then in 2017 with the Tic Tac videos, and then recently in 2020 with the Department of Defense saying, hey, these things may actually pose some type of a threat, especially in a military capacity. So I want to ask you about that. What are your thoughts? Because there's many opinions on this. We have our own and so do others. But what are your thoughts on the threat narrative, quote unquote? Is it a legitimate threat or threatening enough that we should just look at it more to make sure it's not a threat? Well, I think you've, you've, got, to, you've got to look at what you mean by threat. I, I don't think there's an imminent threat of, you know, harm from some non-human intelligence, if that's what it is. Um, but you have to put yourself into the brain of a military strategic thinker and, uh, I've explored this personally with Lou Elizondo, the former um, investigator for the, the Pentagon into the UFO, UAP issue, and he admits that my analysis is pretty much right. When they're talking about a threat, they're not talking about, you know, an imminent threat of invasion from Zeta Reticuli by bug-eyed little green men. What they're talking about is there is a phenomenon which is an imminent threat for pilots' flight safety. I mean, we have incidents where pilots are terribly worried that they're going to have an, a mid-air collision with these objects. I'm, I'm talking pretty much regularly with um, pilots, particularly on the west and east coast of America, but also some now who've contacted me who served in the Middle East. And they're talking about near-miss incursions with these objects, where whatever they are, they're solid, they're showing up on radar, and they're coming sometimes within 50 feet of their aircraft. So they're worried about flight safety. And more importantly, by definition, something that hovers and takes a clear interest in nuclear facilities, nuclear weapons, is by definition a threat. You know, that's that's a concern. I mean, if you and I got into a helicopter or flew a drone over a nuclear facility or a nuclear weapons facility, we'd be in jail pretty damn quickly. And, and the thing that I find really disingenuous at the moment about a lot of people on UFO social media 
is their almost naive truculence. They they attack people like um, some of the uh, the insider thinkers, like Elizondo, like Mellon, for talking about threat, and they're suggesting that what they're doing is it's the Stephen Greer narrative that Stephen Greer has been pushing for years that they're talking about an alien invasion. For fuck's sake, they're not suggesting that at all. What they're suggesting is that by definition, something that hovers over nuclear facilities, something that that takes a close interest in nuclear weapons, and that is beyond any measure of doubt a reality, that's a threat, period. And, and a military and an intelligence service have an obligation by, you know, the Constitution of the United States, but also um, ethically, legally, to protect the people from what they perceive are possible threats. And I, I don't understand why it's even an issue, frankly, that um, that people use the terminology threat. Because if there is an unknown aerial phenomena that is solid, that is real, that is that is hovering over nuclear facilities, that has been on seen on occasion to actually direct beams of light or some kind of energy into the repositories where nuclear weapons are stored. Uh, if it is the case, as people like Rob Salas have testified, that Minuteman missiles have been interfered with, where they've been powered down and not made capable of operating, or in the Russian example, where they've basically been powered up and literally one click away from launch, that is, by any definition, a threat. Why are we even discussing this? And and that that's what frustrates me about this, is that... I want to talk more broadly at the moment about the pathetic, puerile point scoring on UFO social media, where people go, oh, Lou Elizondo said he was the head of ATIP, but ATIP doesn't exist, therefore he's a liar, therefore it's a disinformation campaign. Or, um, oh, uh, people are saying that it's a threat, but there's no evidence of an alien invasion, therefore it can't possibly be true, this is all bullshit, it's all disinformation, let's go back to our normal lives and watch Kim Kardashian. I'm sorry... I'm so tired and weary of the puerile nonsense that passes for intellectual debate on UFO social media. Yeah. It's time to grow up, guys. You know, there really is this infantile, puerile game scoring, point scoring, which is just pathetic. And and I think one of the issues that has played, been played games with is the issue of so-called threat. It's very, very clear when these people are talking about threat that what they're talking about is the issue of military installations, military directly being having their, their security perimeters breached by a phenomenon that appears completely impervious to the detection systems and the um, the weaponry systems of known technology. And that that by any definition is a threat, period. Yeah. It, we should stop the argument and move on and just basically start analyzing it and doing the data analysis. I mean, in the, in, while, while UFO Twitter tears itself apart in this kind of puerile debate about who's a disinformation agent and who, who's basically uh, pushing an agenda that's, you know, some men in black agenda, I, I just don't get the puerile, suspicious, paranoid nonsense that passes for debate on a lot of UAP Twitter at the moment. But um, people have just got to stop worrying about that sort of nonsense and get on with data analysis. You know, one of the things that um, I'm impressed with is there's an initiative by a company called Enigma Labs, which is avowedly about the collecting of data uh, with a view to providing a scientific database that allows people to more correctly understand and analyze the phenomenon. Um, people like Professor Ravi Loeb at Harvard University with his uh, Galileo project. Um, there's any number of initiatives, UAPX, they're all institutions that are about collecting data. That's what we need to start doing. The only way that this issue is ever going to get into the forefront of mainstream media attention is if people put aside their pathetic, puerile differences and actually start collaborating in data analysis and data collection and actually present well-reasoned you know, clever scientific analysis. And one of my favorite organizations in that regard is the SCU, the, the Scientific Coalition for the Study of UAPs. People like Rich Hoffman, you know, they're really superb scientists who are doing a really solid job analyzing data and trying to understand the phenomenon because they accept that it's real. 
But with every step forward, there's two steps backward, because at the moment, there's this troll factory. I suspect a lot of it's disinformation, deliberate disinformation. But there's this troll factory of infantile, puerile trolls who, who basically seek to pull down anybody that comes forward with new information. I'll give you an example. I mean, I've, I've just this morning been dealing with um, uh, follow-up uh, emails, many of them very informative, about a story I ran on Need to Know, the podcast I do with Bryce Zabel, where we featured an interview with a British soldier called John Chapman. He's a British Army veteran, highly decorated, well-respected guy in his own unit. I've checked him out thoroughly. He is who he says he is. He's shared his service record with me. And he testified to us in the vodcast podcast that we do that during a battle, while they were under fire in Ukraine on the banks of the um, urban river in Kiev, they were basically uh, witness, him and seven other colleagues, to a craft of some kind that emerged from three amber orbs in the sky at about a thousand feet. Now, I don't mind scientific uh, response and analysis. I welcome it. I welcome skepti skepticism, and I'm sure we will. We'll get a sceptical rejoinder at some stage, I'm sure, from many people. But um, the puerile, infantile, teenage jock side of UFO Twitter would seek to denigrate a serviceman by calling him or slurring him as a mercenary when he's actually a signed up member of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Um, the, um, the way in which people's motives are attacked and uh, anybody basically pushing something that gives the trolls an opportunity to get an edge, I can understand why, and I read recently that one preeminent researcher is withdrawing for the, from the field because they're just sick of the trolls. Right. Now, that's not scientific criticism. It's not good analysis. You know, one person had a swipe at John the soldier because he didn't film during the battle. And what that told me, of course, was that they hadn't actually watched or listened to the uh, podcast at all because in the podcast, he explains they were under fire during the period that they were in the sighting area. They couldn't possibly pull out a shiny camera with lights on it and direct it at an object in the sky because they would have been shot. And it's the intentional naivety, the the stupid, weird way that people behave to denigrate people like a military service person who have the courage to come forward. And I, I feel the same way also about the people who seek to, do, to besmirch um, people like Alex Dietrich, the F-18 pilot, who has come forward on her own initiative along with other pilots to testify about what she and other pilots have seen. And then they're told patronizingly by purported skeptics that they didn't really see what they saw and they were probably confused. And, um, you know, they probably confused it for a reflection on the inside of their cockpit. We really have to grow up, guys, because it takes, I can tell you as a journalist, a hell of a lot to persuade people to come forward and give evidence. And I'm not here to serve UFO Twitter. I don't give a flying fuck, frankly, about UFO Twitter. Yeah. What I do care is the exposition of the information that's needing to be revealed. And the the interesting thing is that um, there is a selfishness and a uh, an impatience out there from an audience who just see this as entertainment. It's not yeah. entertainment. It's data. It's data about one of the most important, if not the most important issue of our time. But by seeking to denigrate people who come forward, by seeking to attack the motives of people who are willing to come forward with evidence as sightings, witnesses, all they're doing is scaring them off. And I think, frankly, UAP social media should be ashamed of itself. It's time to take a long, hard look at itself and wonder, really, is it, does it serve any useful purpose to behave the way it behaves? Right. And frankly, these trolls, they need to be outed. They need to be exposed. Good sceptical criticism is fine. But people who denigrate the character of people, people who attack people and seek to um, destroy them, they need to be pulled down. They need to be destroyed. Yeah. No, because we can't tolerate that. That's unscientific. Scientists, indeed. There are some scientists who behave in a very, very unscientific way. You know, they have a paradigm that they accept as the reality paradigm. And if it 
if something comes into their worldview that conflicts with their paradigm, then they immediately seek to denigrate the person delivering it. So this is a problem in science as much as it is in in the um, the UAP research area. But I think we're a, this is a broad issue that I'm responding to um, that I think explains why the media, the mainstream media, is largely staying away from this issue. Because, frankly, you should be ashamed of yourselves. We get the, it, too. We'll get people that are even fans that'll say, hey, love the show, but, you know, why didn't you hammer on Preston Dennett to provide evidence for what he was saying? Like, our flavor is that we don't make people uncomfortable. And more often than not, even guys like Sean Cahill, you know, the right-hand man to Lou Elizondo, they'll tell us more things that they've never told anybody because we always joke around and say it's a safe space. So we're not here yeah. to shine the flashlight in somebody's eye. They, everyone has the yeah. right to tell their story in the way they see fit. We vetted these people as well. So it's not like anybody is on our show. But yeah, it's that propensity to just, why didn't you jump down his throat? Well, and you know, or even we had a comment when we said, hey, you know, we're so excited. Um, you know, Ross Coltard's coming on the show. Somebody messaged and said, is it going to be new information or the same recital? It's like, go fuck yourself. Don't yeah, watch the yeah, show then. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. No, and I think we have to understand. say that more. I mean, I, I frankly, I mean, I, I really think that is just an absolutely vital response because, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm at pains to do is to show people courtesy. And um, uh, I, I think um, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting because one of the difficulties you have as a journalist is you often know a hundred times more than what you can reveal publicly. Yeah. And there is a side of the UAP community that seems to feel that it's my responsibility to come out and spill my guts and tell everybody everything immediately. Yeah. And if I don't, then I'm I'm hiding and I'm part of the cover-up. And um, one of the things that people don't understand is that journalists operate under both legal and ethical constraints. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm under an obligation to protect sources and I will always do so. I've been in court cases where I've refused to reveal sources, and I've been told that I could face criminal contempt prosecution if I refuse to reveal it, and I've, I've stood my ground. But it's important. It's absolutely important. If there is, and I believe there is, if there is a cover-up of issues pertaining to this phenomenon inside certain governments, and I believe there is, then the people who hold that information, they need to be respected, they need to be treated with courtesy and they need to be thanked for coming forward with the information they hold. It's funny, I, I had a conversation with this morning with another person who told me about a sighting in Ukraine and they asked me, you know, do you think I should come forward publicly? And I, I, I have to admit, you know, I, I don't know if I would encourage them at the moment, frankly. I think I would encourage them maybe to privately speak to an organisation like the Galileo Project or Enigma Labs or you know, one of the organizations like that collect data. But um, I think we're at a stage now where we just basically have to get on with it and ignore the idiots, the puerile people with the brains of adolescent teenage boys who, who seem to think it's fun to attack people who have the courage to come forward with what they know. And um, there's a really nasty side a really nasty side on UAP Twitter that I think they don't realize just how much damage they're causing. And they've done it, but they know who they are. They've done it for entertainment purposes. They've done it to generate clickbait and, um, uh, you know, bugger them. As you say, fuck them. You know, yeah. it's time to move on. We're trying to destigmatize this and get the taboo away from it. So that mainstream media takes it a little more serious and if that's the first thing that comes up when you search the topic on Twitter, they're going to stay away from it as long as possible because it's not worthy of their attention and they don't want to be drugged down to look just as immature and stupid, right? It's it's not helping the movement. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not a movement. I don't, I don't like the idea that it's a movement. I don't see myself as an activist. I just see myself as a journalist. Uh, I mean, bottom line is, um, I think if the New York Times devoted the same level of coverage to the UAP issue as it devotes currently to the January the 6th issue, uh, you know, the insurrection on the US Congress. Right. Uh, I, I think that we would probably crack this within a year. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. And um, I, I don't believe that it's 
an unawareness of the reality of the phenomenon that's stopping the editors and the um, the journalists from doing it. I certainly know good people like Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal are desperately keen to get stories in the paper there. But no, I think there's a, I, 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 I think they're tempering themselves by what they perceive their audience wants. Newspapers are essentially um, classified advertising wrapped around news. They always have been. Yeah. And, um, you know, while they give themselves pompous titles as, you know, investigators of the truth, the reality is they're still trying to sell ads. Right. And they think people don't want to know about this issue. And frankly, UFO Twitter, UFO social media is doing a really bad job of communicating a uh, unanimity, uh, a collegial willingness to investigate. Uh, they're playing stupid, puerile games, infantile games. And um, there's a kind of a gotcha mentality uh, that I really hate. And I see it, you see it in journalism everywhere as well, but I've never seen it quite so harsh as I've seen it in the subject of this particular field. And there's this attempt to pull people down all the time. Anybody who sticks their head up and basically says, I've seen X, Y, and Z, within a few months, they're pulled down and attacked. And I'm shocked, I'm amazed how many people I've spoken to and I've I've been chasing down old stories that interest me. And I'm amazed how often the reason that the people cite about why they went quiet, why they don't want to engage anymore, is because they, frankly, got sick of the way they were being trolled on social media. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't know whether it's an organised thing, whether there is, in fact, some kind of bloody government troll factory that's sending out disinformation. I, I think, to be honest with you, it's just people who are trying to generate clickbait for their podcasts and their social media blogs yeah. who are basically just going out there generating hate. And what they don't realise, we invest them with power by responding to them. Yeah. Now, I, I don't include in that, by the way, people like Nick West, who, even though Mick's you know, on occasion, I'm sure he'll find issues with some of the things that I've said and spoken about. It's really good that we have people who try scientific skepticism. That's, that's, I'm not being patronizing. I think it's important. Mm. And, and sometimes we do get things wrong. Um, you know, media gets things wrong. People putting blogs up on UFOs, social media get things wrong. And when we get things wrong, we should acknowledge it and we should move on. Um, that's good science. Yeah. But one of the other things too is, um, uh, I've been noticing recently that a lot of the um, the people, like we did a, a documentary uh, a few months ago now where we interviewed a man claiming to be an abductee experiencer, a guy called Jim Marlin in Texas, and he allowed us to test, take away a sphere, a metal sphere that he explained was gifted to him in very unusual circumstances that he believes is alien technology. And it's really interesting because... A lot of people are saying, well, where's the, where's the scientific results? You know, when are you going to hand them over? Um, I don't know you guys an explanation. I don't give a fuck what people on UAP Twitter think. I'll, I'll let Gary Nolan, the professor at Stanford University, take all the time in the world he needs to make his scientific analyses. And in the meantime, I'll continue gathering the information that has come in the door that, that came as a result of me publishing that story. One of the things that amused me was people seem to feel that you shouldn't publish until you've definitively reached a conclusion on something. But that's what a scientist does. I'm not a scientist. I'm a journalist. I report things as they come along. So if somebody comes to me with a bit of technology that they say is alien technology, I'll report that. And yep. if it turns out not to be, then that's fine. I acknowledge that. Yeah. But I'm not saying that's the case. In fact, things are getting very, very interesting with the metallic spheres. There's some very, very interesting evidence coming in the door. And you know what? I'm only going to publish it when I am good and ready. And yeah. the people on UFO Twitter or whoever you are who seem to feel that I have a scientific obligation to publish all my data up front before I allow myself to publish, I'm not a scientist. You know, I, I'm not putting yeah. my stuff up for peer review. I'm not an Avi Loeb. I don't have to conform to peer review standards. I'm publishing news as it happens. Um, journalists are essentially recording the first draft of history. And sometimes that history is wrong. Sometimes it's inaccurate. Sometimes it's misleading. But what we're doing is we're reporting as we go along. Yeah. 
And I think that's one of the fundamental misunderstandings that um, comes through a lot on on UAP social media. People seem to fear, well, why, why, why are you running this stuff now? You know, why not wait until you've got all the results in? Or, you know, why don't you include this in your data? I'm not a bloody scientist, mate. Piss off and go back in your little corner and do whatever it is you need to do to get over your frustrations. Um, I, I really, truly am over these people who um, seem to feel that they have power to tell people like me what to do in investigating the phenomenon. Um, and I think we have to come far more aggressively back at them and say, listen, you you don't tell us what to do. We're journalists. We're investigators. We're digging. We're investigating. Um, and more importantly, and this is the key issue, more importantly, we're going to be courteous. We're going to be kind. We're going to be friendly, even to people we're disagreeing with, because we may be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Do and you think this is keeping people like, for example, like the congressional hearings, did this type of attack and everything else? I mean, we had a, a viewer question that said, you know, in terms of corporate interest, is anyone preventing people from testifying? But A, that question, or B, are people just worried? To, again, you see what happens on Twitter when you make a statement. Everybody wants to rip your head off. Now you want to go to Congress and testify. Are there people genuinely worried about this tsunami of bullshit they're going to bring on themselves if they if they put their hand up and try to try to be helpful? Yes, yes, and yes, absolutely. And frankly, I'm I'm talking to people at the moment who are wavering because they're seeing the level of nastiness and vitriol that's being directed at people who have come forward, like Alex Dietrichs. You know, pretty much anybody who comes forward with any new information at the moment is immediately pulled down and vilified. Wouldn't mind if it was for solid scientific reasons, but more often than not, it's just somebody wanting to have a go, you know, and often yeah. it's nasty. Often yeah. it's really nasty. It's like bullying in elementary school. It is, it is trying bullying. to get it right. Yeah, no, it Plus, is bullying. It's not equal. And it's, and it's funny, it's funny. I, 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 you know, they know who they are. There's yeah. certain key figures and they remind me of the boys in high school who weren't very bright, who were, you know, not very nice people. Most people didn't like them. And so the way they distinguished themselves was by basically pushing people around. And you know what? I've never liked bullies. And I don't like the bullies in UFO social media. And uh, they need to be taken down. They need to be called out and vilified and exposed for what they are. Because what they're doing is they are actually deterring people from perceiving the community of people who are interested in this issue as showing unanimity of opinion that there needs to be a public exposition of this issue. What they're reading instead on UFO Twitter, UFO social media, is we're basically fighting amongst ourselves. You know, we're, we're stricken with um, dissent and argument and nastiness. Uh, if I was a, a whistleblower and I'm in contact myself with multiple people who've told me that they would either want to give evidence or they're considering giving evidence, or in some cases, they've actually been approached to give evidence. And yeah, they're really concerned at what they see. And it's one of the reasons, frankly, why I can understand why there might be a need for secret hearings, confidential hearings that are held in camera in the Congress before any kind of public hearing. Why would you, if you were a defense scientist, an intelligence community scientist with knowledge of a program, why would you come forward and expose yourself to the puerile, infantile bullying of certain cliques on UFO social media? And for that matter, why do we invest them with so much power? Let's just yeah. ignore them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've even noticed uh, on social media, the most obviously is Twitter, like you mentioned, but it's not equal weight. It's not like the person that is saying, hey, where's all your hardcore evidence, like people that are uh, after you. I mean, say just because they have the name UFO Joe does not make them a UAP expert or equal weight to your research. Oh, right? no, I, UFO Joe, Joe Murgia is a friend of mine. I like Joe Murgia. Uh, I have no criticisms of Joe Murgia. He's a good guy. He does yeah, some fabulous was, work. Just, just saying the name. Just yeah. saying the name. No, or, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't want to go, be Jason. Yeah, you actually go. picked the name that the guy exists. Foot in mouth. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Now you've yeah, got to be very careful because, yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, but people they know who they are. I mean, yeah. frankly, there are people out there on UFO social media who, who sadly have diminished themselves. Yeah. You know, for a while there they were doing good critical stuff, and. um 
I don't know why they do it. I think as they're losing relevance, because as this issue becomes more mainstream, a lot of people who've been around for a while on the circuit are worried about maintaining their relevance. And so what they're now doing is they're taking deliberately aggressive contrarian positions, not for good solid scientific reasons or journalistic reasons, but because it generates them clickbait. Right. Because there always will be a puerile, infantile audience out there that loves conflict. And, you know, it may work for them to generate them clickbait, but frankly, in the long run, it's not helping public perception of this as an issue that needs to be driven before the Congress and and exposed and investigated. Instead, what, what's being presented is of a community of people who have an interest in this subject matter stricken with division and divisiveness. Right. But we also have that issue globally where we don't play along with other countries when it comes down to this issue. There was recently uh, a, a group of Jacques Vallée had uh, went to this event and I believe it was France yeah. where all Italy and everybody showed up, England, everybody, except the US. The US did not, was not represented there. And that's an issue because obviously we're not, you know, the rest of the countries are not playing ball with the US and we keep waiting for the US to admit that this is real before we all go, oh, yeah, no, we have the same problem. Yeah, okay, but uh, Jason, I, I think the US has already admitted this is real. Yeah. I mean, I, I think w one of the things that I don't think people realise is just how far we have come since the New York Times expositions in December 2017. I mean, the June 2021 report that was tendered in the um, Congress, 25 June 2021, was a momentous document, even though it was one of the most dull documents, because it essentially admitted that they could not explain 143 out of 144 UAP incidents. And they then, in later testimony in May this year, have admitted that there are now hundreds of incidents, 400 plus incidents at the time of the May hearings, and it's considerably more now. And um, these are incidents which presumably have been investigated by UAP investigators inside the Pentagon and the intelligence community, and they've not been able to find a prosaic explanation for them. So in and of themselves, those admissions that have been made by the UAP task force to the Congress, are that they are momentous. They're extraordinary because you have a nation, America, admitting it cannot explain this phenomenon. It is a genuine mystery. But what I think has happened is there are competing interests here. One, I don't think people realize just how dangerous the world is right now. And most of the people that I speak to in the US intelligence and defense community, and I talk to a lot, they are basically seriously concerned that we are on the precipice of a nuclear conflagration, that, that we you know, are literally a hair's breadth away from a confrontation with Vladimir Putin. A much more dangerous scenario than the yeah. 1963 Cuban Missile Crisis. And that is distracting people from the main game, which for us largely, of course, has been finding out what it is that all these countries know, particularly the US, about the phenomenon. And I think there's been a deliberate slowing down inside the Pentagon and the intelligence community, especially in the last year, because the international situation has deteriorated so badly since the invasion of Ukraine. China's still on the boil. I mean, there's a minister in my government and the previous government who unilaterally committed to go to war against China with the US over the Straits of Taiwan uh, in the event of um, a clash between China and America and over Taiwan. And, you know, for me as a journalist, that's a real worry that my country might be being sucked into a war that could quite easily go nuclear. And so the people that are talking to me about UAPs who are telling me that, yes, the, the Five Eyes Alliance is and still does receive take daily on UAP sightings, um, I'm not surprised they're distracted by the continually de de continuing deteriorating international situation. And I'm not surprised the Congress as well is accepting arguments that I know are being made by people from the Pentagon that, hey, look, let's put this on the back burner a bit for the moment. You know, we've got serious international crises that we're dealing with right now. Um, one of the other issues, the second issue behind all of this, is the possibility that what we're talking about is some kind of advanced technology. I mean, the implications of the Pentagon UAP task force report from June last year are there. Something, someone, seems to be operating technology 
objects, possibly craft, in our atmosphere, under our oceans, and probably also in orbit, that are doing things that are far beyond known human technology. Now, for any nation on this planet to be able to control and master what is represented by that apparent technology is enormously significant strategically. It would give you an it would confer an incredible advantage. And I think that's the second issue, aside from the deteriorating international situation. It's the fact that behind the scenes, I think things like the release of the Wilson memo, which may or may not be a real document, but what it's done is it's heightened public awareness of the issue of a crash retrieval claim, the mystery of alleged crash retrievals inside the US government. I suspect crash retrievals have occurred. I suspect technology that is possibly not human has been recovered. And if that's the case, if I was the US Defense Department and the intelligence community, I would be keeping it secret. I really would. Sure. You and one of, the things sure. Is, one of the things that has happened with things like the, uh, the debate over the Wilson documents, the Admiral Wilson memo, is that it's brought this issue into the forefront at a time that's actually quite inconvenient for the disclosure process. Because I actually think that there was a group of people, especially around the time of Hillary Clinton's campaign for the presidency around 2015, there was a group of people who were working from inside the intelligence and the defense community who were thinking, well, let's do a very controlled disclosure. Let's, yes, let's reveal there is something going on. Let's reveal there is a mystery. But let's be very careful. Let's try and control it. Because, okay, we've got these programs here where we're we're looking at this technology, but let's just keep that to one side. Let's just let's let the public know that, yes, there is genuinely a non-human intelligence on this planet and that uh, maybe we need to reveal that to them before, say, I don't know, 2024, 2025. Maybe there was a strategy in place. And I think one of the issues is that um, the focus of a lot of people on crash retrievals has made it very inconvenient for them now to be more open about that possible revelation. I'm only speculating here, but it would explain, you know, the, the deteriorating international situation and the um, the focus on alleged crash retrievals, the publicity about a program, talk by people like Lou Elizondo, and indeed indications by people like Chris Mellon and others, Eric Davis, Hull Putoff, the suggestion that there is some kind of technology that's been retained by the US government. This has been inconvenient for those who perhaps want to try and control the narrative. And um, I think that's why we're seeing a bit of a walk back at the moment. I, I think that there's a serious possibility that unless the mainstream media embraces this issue and unless UFO social media actually starts acting in a unanimous and, and consensus way and taking a deliberative position where in a coordinated way it presents a viewpoint to the, the Congress and to the the general public that shows a, a unanimity of opinion. Um, at the moment, we're doing exactly the opposite. We're basically tearing ourselves apart. There are um, trolls who are having great fun um, attacking anybody who comes forward. Uh, and if, frankly, if I was a whistleblower, I'd keep my head down. I wouldn't be willing to testify. No, I wouldn't either. If uh, uh, what's going on right now, like you mentioned, is just nasty. Uh, when it comes down to um, your views on what's going on, because we've, you know, we've changed our opinions or our thoughts quite a bit on the podcast. As of late, we've had uh, extra terrestrial, extra tempestrial, ultra terrestrial. So we have all these different ideas. Uh, we think it's a, a just a combination of the whole lot. Like, you know, it's not just extraterrestrial. It could be interdimensional as well. That's the way we're viewing things right now in on the podcast. Do you have any ideas to what is going on? Do you think it's extraterrestrial only or is there something else going on um, that at least you get an inkling that uh, might be happening? Look, all I know is that there is solid evidence in my view that something, someone is displaying a phenomenon which is doing things that we can't do right. on our planet. There appears to be a technology operating, particularly in our atmosphere, but also underwater and in the, in the orbit, which um, is displaying what Lua Elizondo has dubbed the five observables. 
mm-hmm. you know, the hypersonic velocity, instantaneous acceleration, stealth mode, transmedium travel, and um, positive lift, possibly anti-gravity. Um, that's what I know. That's all I know. And all I can talk about is what I know. Um, what I can speculate about is my personal view is that the least likely explanation is extraterrestrial okay. as the broad explanation for what we're looking at here. I wouldn't be surprised if we've been visited by life forms from another planet, but I don't think that explains all of the phenomena that have been recorded and seen. And um, greater minds than I are talking about interdimensional or even crypto terrestrial things that have long been here that have been sharing this planet with us. I'm very much a crypto terrestrial at the moment. I'm, I, I suspect that it's not extraterrestrial. I suspect it's been around us for some time. And um, I don't know why. I mean, the thing that I'm fascinated by, I don't know why the cover up, you know, I really don't know why governments don't just go. Cause I mean, I've, I've had frank conversations with people in the defense and intelligence community where they flatly admit to me that this is real, that they believe there is a non-human intelligence that is operating on this planet. Now, I don't know that for sure. I'm not saying that. I'm not alleging that because I have no evidence to support it. But people who purport to be in a position of knowledge are telling me that that's their view. Now, what I don't understand when I talk to them about it is why? Why the secrecy? Why not just com- completely be completely open and upfront about it? And I think there's a, 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 a series of explanations. Um, I've been told a few. One of them is the reason why Lou Elizondo says he's quite somber about what he knows. Um, uh, I I just don't know. I mean, I'm speculating if I tell you what I think. I mean, I I um, all I know is that there is a phenomenon that is displaying itself, and it's displaying itself much more overtly at the moment than it has in previous decades. We're we're going through a period of extraordinary display of the phenomena, and um, my sources in military tell me that it's being recorded on um, specialized radar systems and synthetic aperture radar far more commonly now than it was 10, 20 years ago. Um, Why it's showing itself more frequently, I don't know. But there's there's a greater level of overt display of its existence. And maybe it's a consciousness-raising thing. I have no idea. But... Um, what I do feel very, very strongly is that um, we are doing ourselves an enormous disservice by getting bogged down in debates about whether it's real when the US government has admitted formally that it's real. And we just need to stop tying ourselves up in knots about it. I mean, that's where I disagree with Mick West because Mick West keeps on coming on with his bloody seagull theories and his reflections <laughs> on visors theories. And, and and you know, it's kind of like tilting at windmills. He's the Don Quixote of skepticism. He's still tilting <laughs> at the windmills of skepticism when, frankly, the bus has already left the gate. You know, it's yeah. it's ridiculous. The The simple fact is the United States has admitted the most powerful country on this planet has admitted there there is a phenomenon it cannot explain. And and I presume that they have investigated that phenomena prosaically for prosaic explanations and not been able to come up with an explanation. And and that's the thing that fascinates me, is that that's what requires to be explained before the Congress. That's why I found the the appearance of... um, Mr. Moultrie and Mr. Bray from ODNI in May. So totally frustrating because the Congress, albeit well-intentioned, many many congressmen were very well-intentioned, they had no idea what questions to ask. There was such a unique opportunity to question two of the most powerful and the most knowledgeable intelligence officials on this issue on the planet, and they missed their boat. They missed their opportunity. So I can only hope that public momentum to push for public hearings, not just secret hearings, but public hearings continues because there's indubitably going to be private hearings. I'm sure that some of them have already happened. Multiple such hearings have already happened. And I've spoken to politicians who've been in those hearings and their staffers, and it's rocked their worldview. But frankly, I don't think the public is going to get an insight into what the Congress is or has been told um, uh, unless they agitate. 
unless they make it a political issue. It needs to be a political issue in the midterm elections. It needs to be a mainstream concern in, in mainstream media. And frankly, at the moment, it's not. Uh, it's, it's dying. Uh, and part of the reason why it's dying is because UFO social media is tearing itself apart, listening to trolls who are just having great fun causing dissent and mischief. Yeah. Too much fighting. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 great that uh, journalists like yourself, sir, are are taking this seriously, and that you're reporting on this, and that you're you're investigating it, because it gives it more credibility. Here in Canada, we have officially acknowledged five incidences that uh, have taken place historically with UFPs and UFOs. We have five coins now that are official, uh, that have uh, the incident you know printed on it and everything. So it's awesome. The problem is, is that our journalistic aspects in Canada is horrible. They wait two weeks behind the United States before they confirm anything. And it's the same thing with the UAP. Like we were seeing a lot more activity on CNN and all that jazz interviews left, right and center. And Canada was two weeks behind to start reporting that this might be real, but they still use slides that make it look silly, right? And now on a lighter note, let's look at UAPs. How is that a lighter note? That's like the most serious topic in the world. So I, I don't understand how they come up with that. So it's great that journalists like yourselves with really great reputations are taking this seriously because as for me, I, you know, I, I'm in awe of everything that you've done so far because that takes a lot of balls you know, to, to be able to come out like that and say, hey, let's look at this subject seriously, give it some credibility and severity that it deserves. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that I can bludgeon some American network into putting up the funding for what I dream of doing, which is long form TV series investigation into the phenomenon in a really right. credible and authoritative way. Um, I'd really like, uh, Bryce uh, Zabel and I are really keen to do more long form investigative journalism that's well funded. Right. Uh, because you know, there are some shows on American TV, but I'll be honest with you, I don't think they have enough journalistic rigor. And one of the things that I've been quite pleasantly impressed and surprised by is when the audience engages with us and me in particular, it's quite overwhelming. I mean, I, I'm getting 300 to 500 emails a day. I mean, I apologize to you guys because when you first emailed me, I didn't find your email for a couple of weeks because I'm just snowed, oh absolutely God. snowed with people from all over the world who are asking me to investigate their issue, their sighting, their data. Um, and there's a hunger out there for long form investigative analysis. And yet what seems to be happening is a trivializing in a lot of the TV shows and a lot of what's done on UFO social media, it's almost trivialized and mocked and derided. And that's not what the audience want. They want to be taken seriously. And, um, you know, I, 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 I for example, um, I aired uh, in one of my documentaries um, an interview with a Queensland farmer in Australia who suffered cattle mutilations on his property. And um, as a result of that story where he described these most extraordinary, um, beyond surgically precise cuts, you know, he, he was describing literally um, all of the tissue on an animal's head being excised with clinical precision, like not one little iota of tissue was left on the animal's skull. It was completely exsanguinated, um, totally, you know, beyond the expertise of any veterinary surgeon. Um, one of the cases that I examined was a veterinary surgeon where, um, as you probably know, cows have got three stomachs. And to do an autopsy on a cow, you you have to pull out the first stomach, then the second stomach, and to get to the third stomach. Is it three or four? I can't remember. Four, I believe. It's four. Yeah, it's four. You're right. Well, in this case, the third stomach could only be accessed by lifting the first and the second stomach. And then he literally got there, and the third stomach wasn't there anymore. There was an excision. There was no blood. It just wasn't there. And it was technically impossible, this veterinary surgeon told me, to have removed such a large organ with no discernible excision points on the animal's exterior carcass. And, you know, the, the, the veterinary surgeon showed me the photographs that he'd done of the autopsy. He was baffled by it. But the terrible thing was he was terrified for his reputation in 
coming forward, speaking publicly. Um, I still talk to him and engage with him, but this is the dilemma that we have at the moment, that there are witnesses out there who hold evidence like that. He's sitting on files, photographs, detailed autopsy analysis, strong, overwhelming evidence that there really is something to the cattle mutilation phenomenon. But he wouldn't even speak to his professional body in Australia because <laughs> he's worried about losing his job and losing the credentials that he has, that he enjoys, that he's built up over 30 or 40 years. And the irony is I'm the recipient now of probably six or seven, probably let's say half a dozen such cases of surgeons, veterinary surgeons contacting me from all over Australia and also from over the world, all over the world, who've had similar cattle mutilations incidents. And none of them feel confident about coming forward because we still have this climate that we ourselves have allowed to foster of negative trolling of people who have the courage to come forward. And believe me, sirs, this is the issue. You know, we are, there is not any issue that is more stigmatized and taboo as a subject than the subject of UAPs and the paranormal phenomena that appears to be associated with it, such as abductions and cattle mutilations. I personally think we should be investigating this phenomena, whether it's real or not. You know, people are claiming that it's real. Let's investigate it. But the difficulty is that the people who can validate it, and I know this from personal experience, the witnesses who are sitting there on incredibly important evidence, they're looking at the way that we behave as investigators. Right. And sadly, whilst I'm happy and confident in my own behavior, and I'm sure you're confident and happy in yours, we are disgracing ourselves as a community with the way that we treat people who have the courage to come forward. And this is why this matters. So right now, across different parts of the world, there are people who are watching the US Congress very, very closely. Some of them have been approached by congressional investigators from the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Intelligence Committee, and they've been asked, would you be willing to give evidence in public hearings? And they're equivocating. And who can blame them? Would you? You know, the, the, the interesting thing is that... Um, one of the lines that's often used by purported insiders to dismiss why the public should know about this issue is that supposedly they're not ready. Maybe we're not ready. And maybe our infantile and puerile approach to the subject matter, maybe the taboo and the ridiculing, the stigmatizing, maybe that's illustrative of the fact that we aren't ready. We haven't matured. We're not ready for this. Let's just put it back in a bottle for another 70 years and let them get on with their back engineering program. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I I really think people don't realize just how dangerous a situation it is right now. Yeah. Because there are good people that I talk to in intelligence and the defense community who are really keen for you, for the general public, to know more about this issue. Mm -hmm. They think you should know. But they're looking on in despair and just shaking their heads and just going, oh, for God's sake, bugger them. You know, I don't care anymore. Yeah. And and that's the issue. I don't think people realize just how much damage is being caused by the anti-intellectual, ridiculing, trolling nastiness from a very small but very vocal minority. It's not a, t it's not a tangential side issue. It's the issue. Right. And And one of the issues is, Behind all of that is so much of what passes for investigation on UAP research is just opinion. You know, mm -hmm. it's just people saying what they think. Yeah. There's no attempt at rigor. And really, it's got to stop because it's scaring people away. And frankly, we don't deserve whatever it is that needs to be disclosed if we don't behave responsibly. Yeah, agreed. Especially if it's going to take an opening of our own minds intellectually to even grasp what the hell this is. Like, you know, everybody used to be quote unquote nuts and bolts ufologist. And now you go down the rabbit hole and it's supernatural and, you know, cryptid based and all kinds of weird shit. It, it, you need to have a bigger brain than you've ever had. 
And if, mm. as you said, we are infantile and immature about this, why the hell would they tell us? Like we're displaying grade three rhetoric on something that is like physics level, you know, university uh, of a concept. We are not yeah. ready if that's the best we can put forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think one of the most um, enjoyable interviews I've done this year was with Professor Michio Kaku, yeah. who has a scientific rigor about him because he's a brilliant scientist. But he also has the the capacity for imagination, mm -hmm. the, the capacity to think creatively. And that's so rare in science, because one of the things that's not really talked about in science is that even science is guilty of dogmaticism. You know, there's a, there's, uh, I mean, I, one of the things that I would gently suggest in his analysis of the Ukrainian uh, UAP objects, there were two failings. Uh, Professor Ravi Loeb did, a, I think, a, uh, an analysis of the Ukrainian astronomical paper, which suggested they'd seen so called phantoms um, uh, with their astronomical equipment over Ukraine. And I was interested in that because it was, whilst separate and irrelevant, it was in the same area as my British soldier source was telling me he'd seen an object. So I was interested to read the paper. Now, there's two issues. Firstly, the Ukrainian scientists appear to have made a terrible mistake in their numbers, and Avi Loeb quite correctly picked them up on that. But the other mistake that I thought that possibly Avi Loeb is oblivious of, but then I looked at the um, website of the Galileo project, and it's their avowed opinion that they won't de depart beyond known physics in explaining phenomena. But one of the issues here is that it's clear that whatever this phenomena is, you know, Avi Loeb was basically talking about the way these objects moved, didn't, you know, uh, if it was as the Ukrainian scientists described, it couldn't possibly conform to known you know, terrestrial physics, therefore it's not real. But I think one of the things that I find interesting is when I talk to other scientists, they're saying, yes, but quantum science admits the possibility of explanations that are not within known Newtonian physics. Yeah. And so I think what perhaps needs to happen in mainstream science is there needs to begin to be the acknowledgement that whatever this phenomenon is, it's displaying capacities that can't be explained with Newtonian physics. Yeah. And that as we move into the quantum world, we're talking about the possibilities of um, an Alcubierre drive, which allows distortions of space time to move at extraordinary speeds and distances and across time, across the universe. It's only a theoretical possibility at the moment, but perhaps this explains this phenomenon. And I guess one of the things that really surprised me was in as eminent a professor as Avi Loeb's analysis. And I, I see now that I understand his Galileo project, he probably quite rightly constrains himself to what he believes he knows from accepted modern Newtonian physics. But the, um, the issue is we have to start opening our minds scientifically to the possibility that the explanation lies outside known human science. Yeah. And so if we in UAP social media need to open our minds, I think mainstream science needs to open its minds as well to the possibilities. And that's where Michio Kaku is quite refreshing and interesting because he's conceding that, yes, the phenomena is displaying technologies that are beyond known terrestrial science. And that's where it's getting interesting because there's a dynamic happening inside science where thinkers like Kaku are basically pushing back against mainstream dogmaticism, which basically says, no, it can't possibly be true because it's not in my textbook. Right. Um, and the reality is maybe the textbooks are wrong. Yeah. yeah. And, and similarly with UAP social media, I don't think we should exclude what some people ridicule in social media, uh, things like the abduction phenomenon, the experience of phenomenon, um, the cattle mutilation phenomenon. Because in my book, as a journalist, there are so many witness sightings that establish, if you like, a um, an a priori assumption that, okay, there, there is clearly something here. Prima facie, there is, there is something here that needs to be investigated. Do we, just because we find it confronting to our worldview, do we just immediately ridicule it and dismiss it? I don't think we should. I think we should investigate it. And if the response of people in the 
social media sphere is going to be to ridicule and denigrate people who have the courage to come forward and say, well, look, frankly, this is what I saw. I don't care what you think. This is what I saw. Then it lessens and diminishes the critics more than it does the person coming forward. And I think this is the issue is that there is a, um, a lack of science being shown by some scientists and there is a lack of science being shown or a lack of rational analysis being shown by some in the field of people who do this kind of investigative research. Mm. And so it's vitally important that we, yes, accept scepticism, we accept criticism, we acknowledge when we are wrong, um, but let's be nice. Yeah. Truly. I mean, I, I, it's not hard. Um, the best scientists I've ever met have been open-minded, kind ones who aren't egotistical, who embrace ideas and, and who love the mischief and the fun of thinking about alternative explanations. And that's the way, frankly, good journalism works as well. Um, a lot of journalism is intuitive. You know, a, a lot of it is based on a gut feeling that drives you to investigate something. And you often can't put your finger on why you think there's something to it. But at the very beginning of my research, when I was writing my book, I remember I read all the history. I went through the CIA's library. I mean, for example, I was reading about CIA documents that showed that there were retrievals of disks. These are still unexplained on the CIA's records, official records, where the CIA is acknowledging recovering disks, large disks. That's crazy. Why, why, do we, why do we consume ourselves with this pathetic infighting and nastiness when there is this reality out there that needs to be investigated and confronted? All we're doing is playing into the hands of those who seek to distract us. Yeah. And I, I think that inevitably is what is going to happen. And I, I frankly, I'm very, very pessimistic. I was a lot more pessimistic at the beginning of this year before the Ukraine conflict. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm less optimistic now because I think that the, um, uh, the international situation has deteriorated. I think that there's greater priorities now than UAPs. And frankly, I think the whole thing's going to slide onto the back burner indefinitely. Uh, you know, we're moving into a really serious international crisis right now, yeah. far more dangerous than in, in any time in my lifetime. Uh, and and I, I wouldn't blame the intelligence community and the defence community for going, you know what, let's just shelve this UAP stuff for a while. Congress, yeah, let's just forget about those bloody hearings for a while. I wouldn't be surprised. I've got no indication of that happening. But And I know that there are whistleblowers talking about coming forward. Gary Nolan, Professor Gary Nolan, told me he'd actually met some of the whistleblowers who he knows will be giving evidence. But the um, the, the simple reality is that um, unless we keep up the pressure and unless we show a unanimity of a consensus position that this is something that is worthwhile investigating, all we're doing is playing into the hands of those who seek to lie and dissemble for another 70 years. The Richard Doty's of the, uh, of the industry, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I don't for the life of me understand why Richard Doty gets any traction anywhere on <laughs> any investigative program because he's an admitted liar. He's an admitted disinformation yeah. agent. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I, I quite like him. I mean, the odd thing is when I've watched him on YouTube videos, he comes across as quite an amiable and friendly guy, right. which is what disinformation people have to be. Yeah. But the fact that he's admitted essentially running an intelligence operation against a US citizen, that in and of itself is a crime. Yeah. I, I don't for the life of me know why his admissions haven't been investigated by Congress, because after the um, church hearings, the church commission hearings after Watergate, there were very strict rules placed on the intelligence community in America to stop them from running intelligence operations against American citizens. Hmm. But the Paul Benowitz story that Richard Doty was up to his neck in is a story about running an intelligence operation to disinform and eventually drive crazy an American citizen who was a loyal and patriotic citizen, basically raising his concerns with the US government. Mm -hmm. So why? I mean, why do we give people like Doty currency? Yeah. He, he's admitted he lied. Let's move on. And now he's going to conventions, making money. Some yeah. people are making some really good money at this. 
it's crazy. Uh, it's a crazy world, like you said. Uh, the world's getting crazier as uh, as uh, the year goes on. Uh, Louis, do you have any final questions for our guest today? No, I just want to, uh, you know, extend a huge thanks to uh, Ross Coltart here. And basically, what you were just saying towards the end, as far as you know, non-linear thinking, non-Newtonian thinking, and I've said this before: the phenomenon is not stranger than you think. It may be stranger than you can think. And if we don't open our minds to to bigger and better ideas, you know, gentlemen like Jacques Vallée have been doing this for years and say, yeah, I've changed my mind a dozen times, but still maintain that humility and uh, the friendliness and the open mindedness. If it wasn't for that open mindedness, we wouldn't have got to where we are now. Mm -hmm. So thank you for everything you do and are continuing to do. It's refreshing and it's much needed. As we've said, there's so much shit out there. Uh, if it's not for guys to keep pushing that and saying, you know what? Don't listen. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. We're getting somewhere. And uh, you're definitely one of those players. So more of a thanks than anything. Well, thank you both uh, to both of you, Jason and Louie, and um, uh, keep on doing the good work you're doing. And uh, I hope it all goes well for you. And uh, I promise you I will keep on tilting at windmills. Nice. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Ross. All the best, guys. Cheers. Cheers.